Alrighty. Well, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium here live all across the internet. We're not quite live everywhere that we could be. I know that we're <laughs> live here on Facebook. I can see some folks tuning in right now. We've got some folks joining us over there on YouTube as well. And we will be joined by our Franz over there on Twitch momentarily. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. My name is Patrick. I work for the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team. Joining me over on the lav mic, we've got Emily. Emily, how you doing? Oh, it's a fantastic Friday afternoon here on the back deck, Pat. Delightful. And uh, if you folks out there, if you are joining us right now on the live stream, if you could just go ahead and let us know that you can hear us okay, that you can maybe hear the sound of the ocean as well, if you can. Let us know if we're loud enough for you as well. But thank you so much for being here, everybody who is tuning in. So it's beautiful Friday here in Monterey Bay. As you can see, we're looking here a view from the back deck. We have the capacity to zoom in as well, and we'll be looking for your directions as to what it is that you would like to look at uh, while we are here all together. But this view from the back deck of the aquarium, we're looking currently off in the distance towards, um, let's see, we've got Seaside, Sand City, a little bit of uh, the Embassy Suites there on the side. So heading towards Delray Oaks in the background, you've got Mount Toro. Here in the foreground, we've got a beautiful kelp forest that hangs out here off the back deck and those really famous rocks for any aquarium visitor that's come here to the back deck. You see those rocks there covered in cormorants and every so often there will be some harbor seals there in view. And Emily is on the camera work right now. So we'll be able to zoom in and take a closer look at some of those critters. There's a closer look at some of those, what I believe to be pelagic cormorants there. We have two main types of cormorants when you're here off the back deck of the aquarium, pelagic cormorants and brant's cormorants. The brant's tend to be a little bit further towards the Monterey breakwater as we have a nice plain intrusion of sound going by from the Monterey Regional Airport, very close to us. So these are some diving seabirds that like to go out there into the bay, go snap up some fish and uh, other animals there on the reef. And these are animals that you'll often see uh, warming up in the sunshine and drying out their feathers before they go for another dive. I've actually been out there scuba diving in the Monterey Bay and I've had one of those birds come right up to me about 80 feet deep and I can tell you it's really quite surprising when you get out there and you're diving and suddenly there's a modern day dinosaur looking at you wondering if maybe you can help <laughs> corral a goby over to you. Uh, Emily, do we have any questions about the cormorants right now as we're, we're monitoring the computer, how it's doing? and uh, the folks joining in, anything the folks want to know out there. You know, I haven't seen any questions coming in yet over on Facebook and Twitch. The limitations of the phones is that we have two phones up, so we're looking at two channels. We're gonna try and uh, take a peek over on YouTube as well here. Oh, no worries. Yeah, so just another beautiful day here off the back deck. That's one of my favorite parts visiting the aquarium is that you're able to Take a closer look at the bay directly from the back deck. If we zoom out real quick and pan over, you can see there are some of our aquarium visitors and some of our intrepid guest experience naturalists helping show folks what's going out there off of the back deck. And as we zoom around here, I think, Emily, if you want to try to line us up here on a sea otter, that would be a lot yeah. of fun because that's one of the great things about visiting the aquarium, everybody. Pretty much guaranteed to see a sea otter here off of the back deck. You know, oh, uh, we, yeah. are, we did get an observation there that uh, there was a sea star, oops, sorry for that jumpy camera work there. Uh, there was a sea star over there on the rocks with the cormorants, yes. Oh yeah. Sharp eyes might have spotted and uh, I actually, I wasn't paying attention at all. I couldn't tell if it was a, probably a bat star. It might have been an ochre sea star. Yeah, but. so typically from the back deck, you will get to see some echinoderms, those spiny skinned friends of ours. Uh, and uh, ochre stars tend to be the ones that hang out in the mussel beds. They like to get on top of the mussel and pry it open ever so slightly using their very, very powerful tube feet. And once they can pry open that mussel, they'll be able to 
get their stomach inside of the shell and start digesting the muscle inside its own shell, which is kind of insult to injury if you think about it. And then <laughs> every so often off the back deck, you'll get to see a bat star crawling around on the sea grasses, and it's also taking its stomach out of its mouth to digest bacterial growths and other things, uh, or scavenging here along uh, along the coast. Yeah, we're leaving the otter to go back and take a closer look at There's that another, sea star. Yeah, another sea star, even closer. Right so this one, definitely ochre sea star that's uh, yeah, we would hanging be, out on the rocks. We'd be right remiss to title. not have the sea star of the show here, Emily. So um, those ochre stars are incredibly powerful. Uh, they have some of the widest ambulacral grooves on the arms of them. And that's a just very fancy way of saying the rows <laughs> along the arms where the feet go. Uh, <laughs> and so those grooves are very, very wide. They have very strong uh, tube feet that allow them to latch on to the rocks and get pounded, slapped in the face by the ocean waves as they are dining. I don't know about you, Emily, but next time we go to a restaurant, it could be, we could try to replicate what it's like to be a sea star in the inner tidal feeding on a mussel <laughs> by just having the waiter come over and just throw a bucket of water on us every so often every and see couple how much of we seconds. enjoy our sandwich. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, you know, how many tips that waiter is going to get, but uh, yeah, yeah, might be a little uncomfortable for us yeah, humans. But, maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe not 15%. Yeah, maybe, not, for, maybe not five sea stars out of five. Yeah, no, not, yeah, yeah definitely there's going to be a lot of yelps going on, but it's not going to be the... <laughs> not going to be the message what well, we've got a we've got a couple of questions yeah, coming yes. in right now folks curious about if it's high tide or low tide oh, temperature is like mm -hmm. out here and uh folks curious about some of the white caps that we are seeing in the distance oh, i feel yeah. like we can definitely talk about right now um especially it is upwelling season yeah why don't we pan back out over to the yeah. otter so we can see some of those white caps there in the distance yeah we are very well protected currently we're standing on a splash zone deck over by the penguin area so we're actually quite comfortable but just around the corner from us you got a little bit of a frigid wind that's blowing north to south and what you're mentioning there emily about that upwelling this is the time of year where the entire food web gets kick-started for the rest of the year as far as the planktonic community and things that feed on the plankton are concerned we also have huge amounts of kelp growth that tend to happen this time of year if we get that cold water but yeah, that relentless wind blowing down the coast is going to be pushing the warmer surface layer of water that's along the shore out towards the open ocean. And that is, oh, we've got a whale in the background. I don't know if you saw that, yeah. Emily. There's a little whale blow out there. there Couldn't a, see who it was. Taking a walk along the coast earlier. Oh, There's been tons of whales. I see triple gray whale spouts out there. I don't know, Emily, Ooh. if you've got that centered give me up. A, give me a direction here. Uh, straight up from where we just had the white cap with the gull just going white right White cap over with the gull. But All right. straight on, y'all. Oh, there's another blow. Oh, this is going to be awesome if only we can see them and everybody tuning in <laughs> can't see them. But gonna... that's an extra incentive for the folks to come down to the aquarium to the back deck and try to see. The... Yeah, there's another gray whale blow right off there. Heading towards the Fort Ord dunes there in the background. We've been having lots of gray whales migrating through the Monterey Bay right now. They're coming back up from their breeding grounds in Mexico where they are hanging out in Baja. Oh, another gray whale blow right there. They're off of the lagoons of Baja, having their calves in the very shallow protected zones. And then when they come here to the Monterey Bay, they're on an incredibly long commute going from Baja all the way up north of Alaska uh, to go and feed there just under the Arctic Circle on abundant mycids and other shrimps and things that are growing up there. So they're on this epic migration. When they come here to the Monterey Bay this time of year, it's pretty stressful as a mama gray whale because this is when the orcas are coming down from the Pacific Northwest and moving in to go and try to feed on those young calves. And uh, that is some of the drama that happens in the Monterey Bay every year around this time. And if you ever watch one of those uh, Netflix documentaries, you may have just recently seen the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary in our great national parks uh, on Netflix. When you see that drama of gray whale calves in the Monterey Bay can happen right here from the back deck. We've actually seen orcas predating on gray whales. And so the next time you're at the aquarium, when you come into the building, you'll see the gray whale sculptures and the orca sculptures in the rafters. 
And that's meant to be some of that storytelling of the drama of the bay that happens just beyond the back deck. So there you go. We got... Yeah, we got a great view of them right now. It's definitely two, probably mom and calf. Oh, um, that's awesome. Because you can definitely see a bigger spout followed by a smaller spout. Smaller spout comes up about twice. Yeah. And that's just baby needs a little bit a little bit tiny more, lungs yeah i got needs tiny lungs need mm -hmm. a couple more breasts than mama there um so that's probably mama and and calf there they're hugging that coastline though trying to stay away from those those orcas so we're getting a great look at that right now and uh if you're trying to figure out how patrick and i are able to spout that these are gray whales versus a lot of the other kinds of whales that we have out here in the bay because this is a, a cetacean station <laughs> uh, here in the Monterey Bay. We get humpback whales, blue whales, fin whales. We get all these amazing cetaceans out here. Those are all of those different kinds of whales and dolphins uh, that we've got. Uh, we can tell that these are gray whales from the shape of the spout. So they have the this blow, kind of yeah. a wide heart-shaped blow uh, as you watch them coming up and taking a breath here kind of look for that nice low blow across the surface of the water humpback's going to be much taller if it's a blue whale kind of looks like a big old fire hydrant oh, there, they go, the, there they go there they go yeah now. right on cue thank you thank you gray whales great job yeah and as <laughs> always whenever great. you see a gray whale uh taking a breath it's always a low blow that um, <laughs> get after you there yeah so that's just some of the drama you can see here from the back deck the monterey bay aquarium is the only aquarium in north america that is located on the physical uh -oh. open ocean um so getting the comment that we might have lost sound lost sounds nothing has changed uh -oh. on our side Still looking good there. Still looking good in OBS. Still looking good in OBS. Yeah. We still got the sound mm. there. Let us know if that's happening all across the platforms. It would be a new thing for us to break the sound without touching anything. Abby over on Twitch says sound is good there. So it okay. might just be if uh, you lost sound, maybe give a quick refresh yeah, on that browser refresh, window yeah. sometimes. Sometimes. Now, yeah. now, Emily, uh, something that is sound is the Puget mm -hmm. Sound, and that is where a lot of those orcas that come down to eat the gray whales come down. So every once in a while, we get to see our Pacific Northwest orca friends that come down here to take a closer look. Uh, but one thing I did want to go back to, because we, we showed the otter, we didn't talk about it, because there's nope. so much activity around the sea star and the gray whales, but why don't we go take a look at another little bit of charismatic megafauna of our favorite sea otter friend that's hanging out in the kelp forest. Because every so often people ask us, are those wild otters off the back deck? And yes, everything you see beyond the aquarium's walls outside, that is all the wild Monterey Bay. And you've got sea otters right there in the kelp, wrapped up. What they tend to do, especially when it's super windy, is roll around in the kelp to anchor themselves to the seafloor. So we've got an otter rafted up there. Now, I can't quite tell until the camera gets there, on it if it's yeah. a mom and a pup. This one might be. It could very well be. The screen. You can see there just the top canopy of that kelp forest. So the giant kelp that we have here, it's one of the most prodigious plants on the planet. I will call it a plant just for the sake of explanation. It eats the sun. Uh, it is a brown alga and it can grow to be over 150 feet long growing in our area from about 70 feet deep. So it goes 70 feet straight up to the surface and then can continue double that distance across the top forming that canopy which obviously affects the shading of the reef and therefore the community that's there below it but also provides a wonderful habitat for those sea otters that were hunted to near extinction back in the day in the uh, 1700s and 1800s russian fur traders were taking all of the otters that they could find and there were only about 50 left in california right around bigsby bridge and now they have recovered to over 3,000 individuals along Central California from about, uh, yeah, about Santa Barbara area to about Half Moon Bay areas. But they used to go from Japan all the way into Baja in those kelp forest ecosystems. And the aquarium was the founder of the surrogacy program. Our female sea otters that we have at the aquarium act as surrogate moms, teaching stranded sea otter pups how to survive so we can return them out there to the wild. and. Uh, 
Some of those otters you'll see are tagged along Cannery Road. If you ever see a sea otter with some flipper tags, those are otters that came through our system at the aquarium, either as research animals to track them or as rescued otters that were then returned to the ocean. So when you support the aquarium, you're helping support that program and many others that help restore some of the balance that was taken through folks coming in and taking ocean resources, mining the ocean for its resources and selling them beyond. Now, people want to come and take a closer look at those otters out there in their backyard. Uh, a wonderful thing. What's up, Emily? We did get a question, Pat. I'm curious uh, about talking about this kelp forest right outside the aquarium here. Folks wondering how deep the water is just off oh, the back deck because question. we can see yep. the rocks just under the yep. surface when it's really close to shore here, but kelp forest is a little bit more mysterious. Yeah, so the edge, the far edge of that specific kelp forest, I know from experience diving out there, is about 60 feet deep, give or take. Uh, obviously with the reef coming up, it can be a little bit shallower. And where the kelp kind of stops here off the back deck of the aquarium is around 15 feet, 10 feet deep, give or take. And that's just a zone that's a little bit too rough and tumble for the giant kelp to really get established. So there tends to be a bathtub ring of giant kelp off of the coast and on those spots where it can anchor itself and be pretty well protected from the strong waves. There's different types of kelps that prefer more wave swept environments, more gnarly environments like bull kelp uh, will tend to be in zones that is a little bit more rugged. And so if you head along the coast of Pacific Grove over towards Point Pinos and around into Pebble Beach, you'll see off of that very wave exposed coastline, you'll see a lot more bull kelp mixed in with the giant kelp there. We have pretty much all giant kelp here off of the back deck with a little bit of bull kelp mixed in. Great, great question. So we're taking a look here, that lighter blue that you see in the water, that's going to be where that kelp forest yes. is, that canopy kind of causing that lighter surface of the water there, the darker water closer to us here is where that kelp is not growing. Yeah, and if you're a surfer in the area, one of the, one of the negatives of kelp is that if you're surfing and you hit some kelp, usually it's like putting on the emergency brake and you just get thrown off of your surfboard. But one of the great things that kelp does do is it helps clean up the surf. As the wave goes through that kelp, it tends to be a little bit less windswept, a little bit of a cleaner wave. So shout out to all of our friends over in Santa Cruz right now across the bay that may be surfing at Steamer Lane on some nice kelp cleaned wave faces out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh Folks also curious about those sea otters that we are releasing in the wild. Uh, if they are staying close by, if they're going real far away, uh, answer is a little bit of both. And yes. actually there's a sea otter swimming right now. I'm gonna get distracted and move the camera. I apologize, Go it's a little it. jerky. You apologize. Apologize. Mm -hmm. There they go, before oh, the dives, oh, perfect timing. Right back there. We did it, everyone, we made it. You got that uh, little sea weasel dive. <laughs> we did. Mm -hmm. We've done it. Oh, and we just had a whale oh, jump no. off uh, in I the distance. That. Let's let's see if we can pan up over there. I'm gonna go with whoever jumped there. That's a humpback whale. Yeah, because that's not gray whale. Gray whales activity. don't tend to do that, and uh, that could mean that we have to rethink some of our identifying strategy. It is so windy that it might be hard to tell yeah. if we do have a humpback or not because it can blow you know, the breath down. It looked gray whale-y, but... Could be both out there, too. We do, that's true, we but we did just have a year, huge so. splash of a humpback whale breaching. Now, humpback whales are a species that use their ears to really communicate, and there's a lot that can be done with a huge splash of a many ton humpback whale jumping out of the water, splashing into the ocean. It could be a whole lot of fun, could be a way of communicating to other humpback whales what's going on in the area. Um, we have seen off the back deck humpback whales slapping the water when there's orcas around, trying to protect gray whales or let them know what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually seen an orca try to bite the tail of an adult gray whale, and then later on we saw a humpback whale slapping the water. So lots of activity out there and when oh it just oh, jumped over on the left of i where, was i was focusing on oh where it was goodness. and not where it was going no it wasn't okay. just the fluke Emily. it wasn't it was just the fluke. breach <laughs> so humpback whales are 
one of the most acrobatic of the whales that we have here in the Monterey Bay and pretty much globally I'd say humpback whales pretty much take the cake. Mm -hmm. Our particular group of humpback whales there are numerous different subspecies depending on who you talk to it's the same species it's a different species it's a subspecies we're not going to weigh into that debate but our population comes pretty much to Monterey Bay and turns around from here and then goes back down off the coast of Mexico off into Central America uh, towards Costa Rica that's where they're going to be having their young is off of uh, off of South America but if you folks have ever been out to Hawaii or to Alaska those humpback whales migrate between those two spots so you've got the Alaska to Hawaii highway for humpbacks and then you've got the for our area the Monterey Bay to Costa Rica Ecuador highway for the humpback whales they're also migrating they're here in the Monterey Bay to feast on abundant bait fishes likely anchovies this time of year and in this particular last few years we've seen lots of anchovies and anchovies are incredibly oily fish, so they're very high in calories. And these whales are putting on over a foot of blubber to then live off of on their migrations as they go further south. They're also going to be feasting on krill, if they can find it. Krill, that shrimp-like crustacean that is very efficient at absorbing nutrients from the plankton. And boy, that was really quite exciting to Pretty have. Exciting. We, got, we got our little... You know, all we would need is a blue whale to complete the, <laughs> complete the picture. Some orcas swimming by. Yeah. yeah if we're going to put it out there in the universe, we're going to put all of it out there in the Right. Universe. Now listen, the, the folks out there who are watching that think that, you know, <laughs> whales and things with backbones might be overrated, I tend to agree. I really like myself a jellyfish, but we have now a group of sea lions going through the kelp forest oh, yeah. here in the front, so it seems like we're pulling out all of the marine mammal stops right now. I think we just True. need a dugong, a manatee, <laughs> if we could, you know, a few. If we could bring back stellar sea cows. That's right, the stellar yeah, sea Yeah, have cow. some kelp forest manatees hanging out. That yeah. would be wonderful. Yeah, that's something for the folks to consider at home is that what you're seeing here off the back deck is what's modern to right now. And uh, this area has changed a lot over its history. And you can imagine that back in the day, out here in the kelp forest, there were likely, you would likely be able to see stellar sea cows, which were uh, our version of a manatee that feasted on abundant kelp. You also would have had what are known as desmostylians way back in the mm. day before people were around. And those are known as water horses to the folks that are into uh, looking into the paleo history of the coastline. So those are no longer around. They're actually, as far as I understand, the only marine mammal that is fully extinct globally, uh, where they're just not around anymore. But this whole area has obviously been a hotspot for wildlife for a long time, also for people who have been living here for 15,000 plus years. And then nowadays for the recovery of the bay, as we have a whole lot of gulls taking flight right now. Oh, yeah. Seems it's like the birds have decided that there was just too many mammals <laughs> being spoken about on this particular stream. They got to go make themselves known. Got it. But boy, that was quite exciting, folks. Ooh, out there. quite a few. There's at least three oh, whales all together. Yeah, there. Oh, no, there's more now. I saw four. Oh, yeah. At least there's one. Those are definitely gray whales. Right? That, yeah, those, those spouts ones are that, so low. Those, those ones spouts, that just blew, the, yeah. yeah, those have to be gray whales. Those got to be grays. And so there must have just been a humpback whale that was like, hey, there there was was, over here. The humpback, the, what we're looking at right now, what is about, if you were along the coast, about a mile away from where we saw the other whale breach. Yeah. And so there's a very good chance that we saw a humpback whale breach, but what we're looking at right now are yeah, gray yeah, yeah. whales because those those blows, even with the wind and everything, those are really, really low. You, so. know, you know, my scientific explanation is that uh, the gray whales told the humpback whale that they the, the aquarium was live right now and the humpback whale was like, no way, check me out. That's, that's my explanation. Yeah, the, well, the humpback whale was just really excited that the gray whales were getting their moment in the sun right. and was there to just say, you're doing great, sweetie. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we're just bay leaning into those explanations <laughs> there for all the folks. You know. 
Never a dull moment off of the back deck. That Never. is for sure. That is one of the great things about coming here to the aquarium is what you see off the back deck of the aquarium is what is inside the building. We have that kelp forest exhibit, the world's first that came online in 1984. We have the rescued sea otters uh, that we have at the aquarium, but then we don't have the whales, we don't have the dolphins, we don't have the seals or the sea lions, because why would you? You've got the world's largest, most adequately sized exhibit of <laughs> whales Just right, right off the back deck. Yeah. Very, very convenient for us here at the aquarium. Boy. Oh, there goes a huge blow. Yeah, that was that wow. was a humpback blow. There's more whales even further out this way. This is a whale of this the stream, a, everybody. We, you know, we were joking about this being a cetacean station. This is now cetacean nation. I'm gonna out say there. it's a cetacean sensation, it's Emily. A, ooh. <laughs> wow, look at those blows. The cetacean sensation sweeping, sweeping. the nation. Yeah, yeah. The notion. The notion. <laughs> But yeah, so those gray whales out there, they seem to be hanging out in the same spot. There could be some food just below them. That's um, mm -hmm. the thing about uh, the Monterey Bay is that you probably know that there's a deep sea canyon, but it doesn't start for many, many miles from here. The average depth of the ocean that you're looking at between here and the distance over there is a little bit over 150, maybe 200 feet. So in terms of a human scuba diver, that is obviously very, very deep. But in terms of a whale that is 30, 40 feet long, that's just a couple of body lengths, like diving in the deep end of the pool. And there's got to be a, a dozen whales out there. Boy, right yeah, now I see some more off to the left. Yeah, the, oh, there we go. Yeah, there's a big group of them right there. They, they're oh, swimming they're towards swimming. our group, so maybe there's going to be a little cetacean congregation. <laughs> I, I, got, I got many, a groan from Anne Marie, so many, I know that I did yeah, well how with many, that. How many more of these do you think we have? How many more do you think the internet wishes to hear? Oh, there is an even closer one to us. Oh, man. Wow. Okay, we're. You know, I want to say that the fishing boat that is just coming out here into the bay, likely looking for salmon, I believe that season Looks just like opened up, yeah. uh, is probably doing a little bit of whale watching right now yeah. themselves. And so that is one of those uh, great things, folks. You know, gray whales were hunted also to near extinction back in the day for lots of different products from them. But whale oil was a very important resource back in the day for lighting lamps uh, because it burned clean and without smoke. And you had all of these whales harvested for a very, very long time until much more recently than most people imagine. Gray, the last gray whale, I believe is a gray whale, could have been a humpback whale, the last whale to be landed in the Monterey Bay was landed in 1973, right then when the Marine Mammal Protection Act went into place. I believe it was landed in Davenport, but if you head over to Moss Landing, you'll be able to see right next to Mbari that there is an old whaling station there. You'll see the pilings extending out into the ocean. So within the lifetime of my parents, we were whaling and then we stopped whaling. And now we have gray whales recovering along the coast to be in the tens of thousands down when they were down to very, very low numbers. And that is an example of the recovery that happens when we kind of let the ocean do its thing, when we let it be as it is and we don't try to remove those resources from the communities that they belong to. One of the biggest problems with Cannery Row was you went from having a sustainable fishery hunting for fishes that were fed to the people who were here, who could make it here, who could be easily, or to people who could easily access the resource. And then once you start taking the fish out, grinding them into fish pellets to then be fed to chickens, to people as vitamin supplements, you start removing the connection from the resource in the community and opening up to the larger world, which is obviously insatiable, especially since you can just keep making more chickens if you're catching more fish. And that decoupling of the resource from the people is what really ends up driving the problem. So when you see here in the bay, when you see the sea otters, when you see those gray whales out there, that's just a return to letting them do what they do. And oh, oh we just missed another breach. There was another breach. I know. I hope that that was just uh, a whale celebrating our change of heart towards uh, <laughs> our relationship with them back in the day. Some of these whales can live a pretty long time. There's a good chance that there are stories within whale communities about what humans used to be like. But nowadays they can come up and take a closer look at us in our boats, maybe sharing our breakfast with the ocean as they pass by. It's really pretty incredible to be in a spot that 
used to be known for what it was able to take from the ocean and now to be some place that is known for what we're able to observe and enjoy from the ocean here from the back deck. All right, well, I'm gonna move the camera away from the group that we were looking at. There was a group about yeah. six that we were looking at, but there's a lot of activity happening out in this direction. We're gonna try and see if we can catch well, let's, that. Let's take a it's closer look It's hard to line up it. the camera where I'm seeing it. Oop, nope, that was, man, I'm gonna pat myself on, on the back. Pat, can you pat me on the back yeah, for well, that Yeah, you can one? pat me on yeah, the back yeah. and you got the pat on the, the pat, back. pat. Yeah. Whoa, there goes another blow. Yeah. So what you're seeing uh, when the whales are blowing there, you're seeing uh, some of the water that's covering up their blowhole get expelled by what's in their lungs. And you're also seeing a little bit of their own inhaled breath. Whales are incredibly efficient at breathing in and breathing out, much more efficient than us. We tend to move very little of the volume of our lungs with every breath, whereas whales will replenish over 80% of their breath on a single blow, which is what allows them to dive down and go grab some food. There's some more. Ano yeah, another there. one out there. Another one. Another out there. one over I there. Know. Wow, there. I don't know where to put the camera. I want to say that there I don't know where to turn the camera. There's so many we'll of them out there right, there. right yeah, now. I'm pretty, sure, pretty sure this means that there's a whale of a good time out there. Mm -hmm. Quite the feast for the beasts out just beyond the shore. Now, Pat, we did have a question because we're yes. seeing the, the salmon boat out there right now. We talked a little bit about that. Folks are familiar with seeing squid boats quite often here yes. in the Monterey Bay as yeah. well, especially if you've ever gone outside at nighttime, taken a walk along the coastal trail, you'll see these big boats, bright lights shining down on the water. Those are going to be the squid boats out there. We have one of the most sustainable market squid fisheries right here locally in the bay. So if you're eating yep. calamari, there's a very good chance that it was caught right here in the bay. We're not seeing too many squid boats right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just because there's not a ton of market squid yeah, out not, there Yeah, not right, right here. Yeah, I saw, yeah. I saw a squid boat off of Pebble Beach just the other day, but it hasn't quite been the huge amounts. There have been some squid spawning mm -hmm. now and again. Uh, but yeah, the, you'll, you'll see those, those big bright lights on the water. An interesting fact that started here in the Monterey Bay with the Chinese fishing community that was living here in Pacific Grove. They were the ones that brought that technique from China mm -hmm. out to the West Coast. They would burn fires of pine wood out over the water. That bright light attracts the squid up to the surface and then they would catch them and dry them in Pacific Grove. So we owe the abalone and squid fishery along this shoreline uh, in terms of its industrialization, its growth to those Chinese fishermen that uh, settled off of Pacific Grove and actually where the aquarium is located right now, Point Ohlone, uh, this used to be part of that Chinese fishing community and over at Maccabee Beach was also where those folks uh, were settled along the, the coast. This whole area has so many different cultures that have contributed to the fishing, uh, to the fishing and to the cultural history of what's going on in the water of the bay. You've got the Chinese starting out the squid fishery. You had the, the Portuguese from the Azores that started a lot of the whaling along with their Japanese counterparts. And then you had the Sicilians that showed up here with their very specific boats that were able to handle the winds and the waves of the Monterey Bay. And that led to the Monterey Clipper and then the Cannery Row days that you know immortalized from John Steinbeck and the Cannery Row uh, novel that named the street. So, so many different contributions from so many different groups of people the, uh, here. The Ama Divers as the well. The Ama Divers as well, yeah. yes, indeed. Yeah. The Japanese <laughs> divers going after the abalone. Really amazing stuff. And now I'm just looking for any sign of a whale. There's third. Uh, <laughs> Amber oh, yeah, is no. over here making me laugh going, Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm, we, we thought when we started this stream, everybody, that we were going to be looking at some otters, maybe some kelp, maybe a <laughs> seal or two. But instead, no. we're just watching humpback whales and gray whales having a grand old just time. Just had here. to say whale. Well, yes, we're looking at whales today. Indeed. It's a, a misty city <laughs> out there, Emily. For those folks that are wondering what the haze is there in the background. A little bit of haze, a little bit of fog, a little bit of marine layer starting, a little bit of sea spray being blown in on the shore. Well, this is delightful. Not a, not a mega terrible time. No, oh. <laughs> mega terra nova e angliae. Not exactly sure how to pronounce it, but that's the scientific name for a humpback whale. 
And Escherichthyus robustus is mm -hmm. a scientific name for the gray whale. Gray whale is one of the more ancient types of whale. And a uh, pretty fun thing, if you ever want to pull up some photos of gray whales or humpback whales, humpback whales have those incredibly long pectoral fins that are, I think, a third of the length of their body, uh, which allow them to be incredibly acrobatic. And then gray whales have much, much shorter paddle-like fins that allow them to be incredibly maneuverable around the bottom because they will turn sideways to scoop up mud filled with copepods and amphipods I think mostly amphipods actually, mm -hmm. head up to the surface and then they will kind of wash the mud and sift it with their baleen. And so if you're a scientist tracking a gray whale, you can usually find them from the mud tracks left on the surface from your helicopter or from your plane. You happen to be looking for them. And you're talking about those huge pectoral flippers of the uh, humpback whale. That's where that, uh, that genus name comes from, the Megaptera. Yeah. Big wing, because it looks like they have big wings, the largest pectoral flippers of any cetacean out there compared to body size. Yep, and yeah. they're very lumpy bumpy on the leading edge of that fin to help them cut through the water, something that uh, various aerospace engineers have looked into as far as lowering the drag on large blades. You'll actually see in industrial warehouses, there will be massive propeller fans that are there to help heat and cool, uh, move air around through large spaces that have bumps on the front based off of research showing that it cuts down on the drag, helps the blade move more efficiently, and something that the whales obviously have figured out. Sometimes on the front of those bumps, you'll have a whole bunch of barnacles that are hanging out there as well. It makes it look a little bit, uh, a little bit hairy, a little bit fuzzy on the whale there. Move the camera a little bit. I keep on seeing some action out here. Now, uh, I did want to point out just to the folks here, as we appear to be coming up on about 10% battery left Ooh. on the laptop, <laughs> merely because it would appear that our external battery pack has opted to have a shorter stream for all of us here today. Uh, one of the things I just wanted to point out to everybody here, um, and just really kind of sign off with all of you folks, is this is going to be my last live stream as a member of the social media team here at the aquarium. I'm moving on to go do some exploration of the ocean, working as a naturalist and underwater photographer uh, outside of the aquarium. It's been an incredible, incredible ride with all of you folks here from the beginnings of live streaming at the aquarium when Periscope first launched and then with uh, Facebook Live, Instagram Live, our underwater live streams from the Kelp Forest exhibit, our 360 underwater streams with California State Parks going live for sunsets, sunrises, uh, being able to bring the ocean to all of you has been truly an honor, and I really, really appreciate, appreciate, I should say, all of you folks here on the social media feeds that have supported, supported us and buoyed our spirits as we watch the whales there off of the back deck doing their thing. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for bearing with my voice and my opening of every live stream with the all righty it looks like all of the technology is working so let's start talking <laughs> um, so thank you so much to everybody out there that has been a part of these live streams live from the aquarium you'll continue to be able to see all of our live cams over on our youtube channel so make sure that you check those out emily will also be here uh, along with many of the other people that you've come to know uh, on various streams on instagram tiktok live make sure that you are subscribed to the social media feeds but just wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much to all of you folks out there for being a part of the Monterey Bay Aquarium live streaming family and for joining us for these moments of relaxation, inspiration uh, here in the Monterey Bay. And thank you everybody for being a part of the Aquarium's mission to inspire conservation of that ocean. You have all been so wonderful to us. And with that, I hope to see you all again soon here on the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media channels. Thanks everyone.